Good afternoon. My name is Detective Chief Inspector Catherine Goodwin, um, leading the investigation into the disappearance of Sarah Everard. It's something that you can't really ever stop thinking about. You can't help but put yourself in Sarah's situation. My wife would have got in that car. Do you know where Sarah is? No. We were investigating one of our own. A serving police constable has tonight been charged with the kidnap and murder of Sarah Everard. We are seeing an outpouring of rage and grief in London. It's almost like a national state of disbelief that a police officer could do something like this. A precious bond of trust has been damaged. It was clear to me that she would never have got into that car without having been tricked as a result of being falsely arrested. The case resulted in an avalanche of complaints of women about male predators in the police service. Most weeks, there's two or three officers going to court for dishonesty and sort of violence against women and girls type mm -hmm. offences. I definitely see Sarah Everard's case as one of those that really changes the view of, of a nation. The crocus of hope is poking through the frost and the spring is on its way, both literally and metaphorically. Hello, Petals. Uh, welcome to the Colin Murray Show on Five Live. Today, the seeds were sown for a life without COVID restrictions. We've been told that if we stick to this plan... London was so quiet. It was such a strange time to be in the capital city. There was nothing else we could do other than watch the news, wait for our release, so to speak, wait for this huge pandemic to end somehow. This country is on the road to recovery, and we have freedom on the horizon. We must proceed with caution, because although we're moving quickly, the virus moves quickly too. We'd all really adjusted to an entirely new way of life. People were very used to extraordinary rules that governed our lives, inability to move freely, uh, the police stopping people, asking them to account for themselves sometimes because of the restrictions of the lockdown. On that Friday morning, I was reading our daily crime bulletin on my phone, and I can remember seeing a number of, of high-risk missing persons across London. One of them just jumped out at me. A 33-year-old female had been walking home and had gone missing. There was a line which I will always remember. It said her behaviour was completely out of character, which just immediately rang alarm bells because whilst in London we have lots of high-risk missing persons every day, it's very rare that we have that line, that it's completely out of character. I was in the newsroom and I saw someone sharing a post to say, missing this young lady from Clapham. She was similar to my age, so it hit a chord with me. More and more people were retweeting it and it was gaining momentum. And within days, we were seeing Sarah Everard's picture all over the internet, all over the local area. In my mind, I thought this was going to be a national story. Police say they're increasingly concerned about the disappearance of a woman in South London. OK, carry on. Sarah Everard, who's 33, was making her way to Brixton from the Clapham Junction area when she vanished. Sarah went missing in my area, the area I've lived in all of my life. And actually, it's something that you think about, and as I know many women in my area thought about, that could happen to you. When the police started going door to door, actually asking for footage from people's uh, ring doorbells, there was clearly a sense of concern amongst locals. And that there was something in the air. 
feeling of women generally not being safe in the area. There was no logical explanation as to what had happened to Sarah. That in itself is actually pretty rare. It was clear from the outset that she had a very normal life. A young lady who was really close to her friends and family, who wouldn't cause them distress or concern or worry by going missing. What we knew is that um, she'd been on the phone to her boyfriend and was walking home after dinner. And the phone call had finished at 9.28. When people go missing and they're doing it of their own choice, there's always some form of contact with your life. You don't, most people don't just tend to like, give up and, and walk away completely. But that phone just sort of stopped being used. So yeah, from 9.28 onwards, clearly something has changed. And that was what made it unusual. Everything just seemed normal, and then it stopped. You can see someone's phone and its location from the network provider. The location was Cavendish Road, and she was on her natural route home. So it fitted with the account we were being given by her boyfriend. They had a phone call, they said goodnight, and she hung up. It became key tracking her on CCTV and her movements beyond that point. That footage of Sarah was walking along Cavendish Road. We could just about see that she had her phone to her ear at that time it's last being used. So we could put the phone in her hand, walking along that road. But it's a huge city. There's the common, there's buses, trains, tubes. You know, there's so many places she could have gone. Detectives investigating the disappearance of a woman from South London have released information about where she was last seen. Detectives released this CCTV image of Sarah the night she went missing, and they're appealing for information. There is clearly a sense of urgency that we're called to what's known as a gold group. A meeting with DCI Goodwin and others from the community to both reassure people and assist in getting more information. But in this case, there was nothing I was able to say to reassure the community because we had no idea what had happened to Sarah. And I think it's really hard for people to imagine that in London, in a highly built up area with cameras and people, how a young woman could just go missing. The family of Sarah Everett say they are desperate for news Sarah's not been seen since being spotted on CCTV. Across this area, every bus stop and lamppost bears Sarah's image. The national concern as to what had happened to her was unprecedented. I want to thank members of the public across London and outside who have come forward with information and continue to pass stuff, uh, information to us through the incident room. Um, we're all looking to try and find Sarah um, as quickly as possible. Thank you. And have you uncovered any more images or what footage of Sarah? We're continuing to review hours of CCTV as we speak. I was thinking, Am I missing something here? Is there something we are not getting? Five days into an investigation, still with no real answers about what had happened to Sarah. And I, I can just remember suddenly, one of our detective sergeants came running over and said, you need to come and have a look at this. The team were just crowded round 
the little screen looking at this bus CCTV where I first saw a white car parked on the pavement. Sarah stood next to it. It was just a really grainy image, but she was wearing quite distinctive clothing. Suddenly, it gave us a whole new line of inquiry. It appears she's probably got in a car. We finally had an answer as to where Sarah may have, have gone. You couldn't make out the registration. But what we did have is the list of all of the cars that had driven past at the time. We were able to find out that it was a hire car, been hired to a, a man called Wayne Cousins. That was the first piece of information. At that time, Wayne Cousins was a name that meant nothing to any of us. So immediately, we start researching the name, also the phone number and the address that had been given when he'd hired the car. One of my team told me quite quickly that there's a man called Wayne Cousins who's shown as a suspect for indecent exposure on a crime report three days before Sarah went missing. He'd gone to McDonald's, drive through with his penis exposed. And that suddenly changed everything because whilst I might have hoped that Sarah had got into the car with someone she knew, suddenly it was clear to me that she'd got into the car of an alleged sex offender. He lived miles away down in Deal in Kent. I wanted people I trusted, people I knew, to be down there to just help me understand what it was we were actually dealing with. I went with the bulk of my team down there, whilst they're still trying to plan for how we're going to get hold of him as quickly and as safely as we can so that we have the best opportunity of finding Sarah. Whilst Nick and his team were running on blue lights to get some control over the address, one of my detective sergeants came running into the office and said, we need to shut the door. You need to hear this. He then put one of our researchers on speakerphone and she said, he's a police officer. He's a serving officer in the Met. He currently works for the Parliamentary and Diplomatic Protection Group. I knew that I had to tell my, my boss and I can just remember the shock of having to just sit on the floor of the office and say to her, you're not going to believe this, that he's a police officer. And then the same questions went through her head as went through my head. Are you sure? The Metropolitan Police had cordoned off part of the South Circular. That's a reasonably big deal because it is a busy road. So I went to that cordon and clearly there was an escalation, quite a big search operation going on. But we were really in the dark. There was still a lot of confusion. I knew that Nick and his team were making their way down to deal. You know, I felt it was important that they knew they were going into the house of a, a police officer. The gravity of the whole situation then became incredibly clear. You know, the moment I told the team, it just went silent. We knocked on the door. Actually, he opened it. I just put my foot straight into the door, showed him my warrant card, and he just went grey. Just all the colour just run out of his face. We'll give it as well. In a moment, you're under arrest, OK? I'm just going to kidnap him at this time. OK, so you didn't have to say anything, but no harm your defence. You did not mention one question, something later on in court. Anything you do say may be given evidence. We went into the living room area while the team began the search to look for Sarah. And then we sat him on the sofa and began the urgent interview. So we're here to talk to you about Sarah. Let's show the picture. Do you no. know Sarah? I don't know. OK. Sarah went missing. Um, I'll show you some 
pictures of, of, of her and the guy. Okay. Do you know where Sarah is? No. Right. right. Now, we believe it. Do you know something about where she is? Because anything we can about where the mother's from. Okay. Um, well, I am in financial shit. Um, and I've been um, lent on by, um, I don't know who they are, they're a, a group, a gang, whatever, um, and they told me why I need to go and pick up girls and get into them. So it then came through that they're going to harm my family, take them away, and they'll use them instead. Um, at that point, I had no option to try and find somebody. So I don't. Um, there's just a couple of names. I was told a place to um, take her. That's it. That's all. That is all I know. They threatened to take my family away from her. You must know more about where she is or how I can find her. I'm sure. I don't know. I know you know. And you I don't know. Us. If you they're taking her in a van, then they they taken her. I don't know. At some point, you're going to end up looking you know, Sarah's family in the eyes. Your family are going to be there. I know. You've got an opportunity here, right now, to help us find Sarah I'm, and bring her back home to her family. I can't. Tell, I us. don't know where she is. You I hunt hand on heart, I don't know where she is. You need to help us. I just need to know where she is. If I could tell you, I, I would. There must be something more. If I honestly could tell you, anything else, then you'd have it right now. Honestly. Honestly. So after what felt like an eternity, but I think it was about 45 minutes, Nick finally rang and said, we've arrested him. She's not here, but he admits to having kidnapped her. Which in itself was a horrendous shock. You know, it's very rare that admissions are made at such an early stage. But then when Nick told me what account he'd given, the whole thing just sounded instinctively untrue. But you have in the back of your mind, could there be some truth in it? Is there any chance she's still alive? I felt like we had to pursue it, so we started to conduct inquiries around that quick time. We knew already that specialist detectives were involved, uh, so it was being treated as more than a missing persons inquiry at this point. So I filed a page lead for the next day's paper from my car. So I went home. It was shortly before midnight. And just as I was about to turn off my phone, I checked my email and I got an extraordinary press release from the Metropolitan Police. been a significant development in the case of the missing South London woman, Sarah Everard. Police have arrested a man in relation to her disappearance. The Met Police have released a statement. Uh, a man has been arrested in connection with the disappearance of Sarah Everard. The uh, man is a serving Metropolitan Police officer. In the newsroom the next morning, people were shocked. You know, you've got a serving police officer someone's gone missing and he's been arrested in connection with that and we never really we never really covered anything like that before uh, that that shocking breach of trust that was already apparent that this was going to be an absolutely huge issue for the police service and we still didn't even know yet what had happened to sarah the police officer is in his 40s he was part of the Parliamentary and Diplomatic Protection Command, but instead of protecting embassies, he's facing questions about a possible murder. And the fact that the man who's been arrested is a serving Metropolitan Police officer is both shocking 
and deeply disturbing. I recognise the significant concern this will cause. We don't yet know very much detail about the Metropolitan Police officer who has been arrested, nor do we know, perhaps most crucially, where she is. And the hunt for her continues. The fact that Cousins was a police officer, whilst clearly incredibly relevant, isn't something that, that particularly changed the way in which we dealt with him. My focus really was on trying to find Sarah. Yeah. We started yeah. to look at the suspect's phone to look at his movements on that night where Sarah went missing. He, or his phone, had been up in Clapham, had then gone straight back down to Dover. He'd been to and from a wooded area in Kent. We were able to establish that his family owned a plot of land within the woods which then suddenly made sense as to why he would have been going to that wooded area. Hodeswood is vast with water, with trees, um, and with significant fly tipping, which actually made it really difficult to search. Today, officers have been searching woodland near Ashford. Lucy Manning is in Kent for us now, Lucy. What well, a week ago, Sarah Everard walked uh, from a friend's house, like many women do, many women walking home alone. And as police said, she vanished from sight. And today, the disturbing news that a serving police officer had been arrested on suspicion of murder, leaving the hopes of her family and her friends looking very bleak. It was in the afternoon on that Wednesday when I had a phone call to say that um, the search teams had found human remains in an area of water. I then went to see Sarah's family and we told them that we'd found a body and that we believed it was Sarah's which, as you can imagine, is just the most horrific news you can deliver to someone's loved ones. There was a small sense of relief that we had found her body for her family. It then moves the investigation onto a stage where what we need for them is to get answers and, of course, to get justice. I went down in order to see the scene for myself. As Sarah's body was taken from the woods to the ambulance, the officers there took their hats off as a mark of, of respect and I think shock at what had happened and who was responsible for it. How are you feeling at the moment? Mm. I'm in a dark place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a picture of a lady. Do you recognise this person in this picture? Who is that, Wayne? No comment. Have you ever met this woman before? No comment. Wayne, this is Sarah. Sarah, Sarah Everard. Did you show your warrant card to her? No comment. 
Is that how she trusted you? Because obviously, you know, as a police officer, we're all in a position of, you know, people trust us, don't they? People trust us to look after them. People trust us to help them. You know, protect and serve, that's what they say, isn't it? That's what we're here to do. We all took that oath, you included. Good evening. In the last hour, a serving Metropolitan Police constable has been charged with the kidnap and murder of Sarah Everard. When Cousins, who's 48, will appear at Westminster Magistrates Court tomorrow. The police watchdog is investigating how the Met Police responded to two allegations of indecent exposure involving the suspect three days before Ms Everard went missing. So we knew on the day of the arrest that Cousins was a suspect for an exposure offence at McDonald's. Whilst he was in custody, I sent some of my team down to McDonald's to take statements from the staff and to get hold of the CCTV. I was at work just doing my normal tasks as part of my role at McDonald's. I did not expect to bring the food back and have an erect penis shown to me. It took me a moment to process what had just happened. Then I became really upset and burst into tears. What were you thinking when you were doing this? No comment. What was going through your head when you were pulling up to these windows with your penis exposed? No comment. The police had not only his vehicle registration and his full name, they also had the credit card receipt that he had used to pay for food at the restaurant. It was an extraordinary development because it, it showed that this man had form. In June 2020, a female cyclist had been going down a quiet country lane not far from Wayne Cousins' home. And she reported looking up and seeing a man of Wayne Cousins' description. He had an erect penis, he was masturbating, and he was looking at her in a very intimidating way. She says that she recognised you as the male she saw because she sees your picture in the media. Was that you? You're coming. Experts have warned that those types of offences are often escalation sexual offences. So somebody who is indecently exposing themselves is potentially an even greater danger if they're not stopped at that point. So the disappearance of Sarah Everard while walking home in London last week has sparked an outpouring from women voicing their anger and frustration. Two women are killed by a man every week in the UK. Vanita Noel, Tracy Kidd. Today in the Commons, it took MP Jess Phillips more than four minutes to read out the names of victims from the last year alone. Maureen Kidd, Wendy Morse. All women know the fear of walking home at night. We hold keys tightly between our fingers. I can't think of a time where I wasn't thinking about, you know, will I walk down to that car park? Will I walk down that alleyway? Will I, would I cross this common? Would I go out after six o'clock? More and more women identified with Sarah just walking home. I thought about the routes that I would have taken from Clapham Common. She went exactly the route that anybody, um, any woman in the area at that time of night would have taken, the best and well-lit route. I'm constantly aware that somebody mm. could hurt you when you are on your own, and that is how so many women feel. There was a groundswell of anger and concern like nothing I've really ever seen before. A number of groups got together on Twitter, online, and started trying to plan a vigil in Clapham for Sarah. Sarah's death has triggered widespread anger about the safety of women on our streets. 
But tonight, the Met has insisted that a vigil planned for this weekend cannot go ahead because of the pandemic. The day of the vigil, there was an inkling that people would be going down anyway. I got sent to Clapham. When I arrived, there were streams of people walking through the park. More and more people kept arriving. And during those hours that I was down at that bandstand, this small ring of flowers grew and grew and grew. As the mound was growing, even more people were arriving. There's been a steady stream of people here in Clapham Common coming to pay their respects throughout the day. Her death has not only shocked this community, but caused a debate across the country. Many now questioning, how safe is a woman walking home by herself? When I went to the common just before the sunset, you could see hundreds of people moving towards the bandstand. Women were standing, their heads bowed. There was a lot of grief. It was a really somber, quiet, respectful atmosphere throughout the day. I left just before uh, the sunset. We put down candles, lighting the way Sarah would have taken to walk home. We put one down for every single woman that had lost uh, their lives to male violence so far that year in this country. Swarms of people are still arriving. And then you started thinking, you know what? People aren't going to leave. anger building. People trying to get up onto the bandstand to make speeches, but the police aren't letting them. Last night, a vigil for Sarah ended in chaos after police manhandled participants in an attempt to break up the unlawful gathering. Yeah, serious questions, it seems, being raised for the Metropolitan Police and how they have handled this extremely sensitive situation. The mayor called those scenes completely unacceptable. The Home Secretary described them as upsetting. When you saw those pictures, did you agree? Did you think it was unacceptable, the way in which your officers acted? I wouldn't have wanted to see a vigil in memory of Sarah end with those scenes. There have been calls from all quarters, uh, many quarters, for you to resign. Are you considering your position? No, I'm not. After Cousins was charged with the kidnap and the murder, that's when a huge amount of work begins for my team to build a case. It's really important that we investigate all lines of inquiry. 
In addition to this, I still didn't have the answers for Sarah's family of what had actually happened in those crucial hours before her death. We really focused on trying to piece together what had happened to Sarah. We discovered how he told his wife that he was working overtime on that night when actually he, he was due to be on his day off and that he'd marked it on their family calendar, clearly indicating that he was planning to do something and he didn't want to be found out about it. On that night, he'd hired his car. We know he drove up all the way to London. Sarah went to her friend's house for dinner, stopping on the way at Sainsbury's to buy a bottle of wine. They had dinner together, and then she left to walk home. We know he then was driving back along Pointers Road when he came across Sarah by chance. We were looking at every vehicle which had passed Sarah, and we spoke to a really significant witness. She'd seen a woman being handcuffed by an undercover officer, and she hadn't thought much of it other than to remark to her partner who was in the car that she didn't think women got handcuffed very often. Now, what she didn't realize was, of course, that she was witnessing Sarah and what had happened to her. And without that statement, we may have never known how he actually got her into that car. And we think we may be able to make out the fact that he used his warrant card, that it was likely he arrested her for something such as a breach of COVID. We know from Sarah and her friends and family that she is the sort of person who would have been compliant with his authority. He drove down to Dover, where he'd parked his own car. It struck me that it's an incredibly long journey and how she must have felt in that car. But it's something that, you know, we can't get away from and can't really ever stop thinking about. He moved Sarah from the hire car into his own car. People have asked how he moved her from one car to the other, and we'll never know. However, in my experience, women who are in such horrifically frightening situations are often just compliant because they want to, want to get out of the situation alive. We were then able to trace his car driving to a very rural area just north of Dover, which is where I believe he raped and murdered her. And then driving to the woods, which is where we believe he hid Sarah's body under an industrial fridge, hiding it from view. We then know he went to drive home, stopping at Costa to get a hot chocolate, behaving perfectly normally, having that night kidnapped, raped and murdered a woman. We know he then went home, spending the day at home as if he'd been on a night shift, so his family would know no different. Before going out to buy petrol in a small jerry can. We recovered a phone call he made to the vet whilst we believe he was stood burning Sarah's body. Hey, yeah, I was wondering if I could book my um, dog in for the, uh, for the vet so I can have a discussion about her issues, please. It's Cousins, C-O-U-Z-E-N-S. The fact that he was able to do things that were so horrific and things that were so mundane and normal at the same time is one of those things that's really chilling.
I am Treasury Counsel, which means that I prosecute at the Old Bailey the most serious criminal cases that are conducted and prosecuted in this country. I first met the Everard family in this very room, in fact. It was immediately clear to me what uh, awful trauma they had been put through, but at the same time how focused and resolute they were in terms of seeing that justice was done. The focus of the case then became on presenting the true horror of what he'd done to the full extent. Wayne Cousins, a firearms officer with the Metropolitan Police, has pleaded guilty to the murder of Sarah Everard in March. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner looked shaken. In court, she'd sat just feet from the Everard family. He did enter guilty pleas at a relatively early stage. That was obviously an immense relief for the family. All of us in the Met are sickened, angered, and devastated by this man's crimes. There was a sense within the police leadership that they were so disgusted and aghast at what someone within their own ranks had done, and that it was such an aberration that they were reeling from this and they were victims themselves. And everyone in policing feels betrayed. And that it wasn't a massive problem, that there was just a small number of bad officers. The Metropolitan Police have faced many difficult times and much criticism, but this must be their darkest day, their own officer pleading guilty to murder. And how did he become an officer when he'd faced exposure allegations in 2015? In Dover, two years before he joined the Metropolitan Police, Cousins was suspected of indecent exposure. No action was taken. In 2015, Kent Police received a report of a man driving around naked from the waist down. Now, the eyewitness gave an accurate description of his vehicle. There is an image of Wayne Cousins in that vehicle because he was captured on AMPR cameras, and the eyewitness also gave an accurate description of the vehicle registration, so it could be linked to Wayne Cousins. He was a police officer at the time, but he was never interviewed, and the case received no further action. Had it been investigated, had he been properly identified, Potentially, he would have lost his job. He would not have had his warrant card. He would not have been able to trick Sarah Everard into that car. A sentencing hearing has begun for the former Metropolitan Police Officer Wayne Cousins. The judge made it clear that he wanted assistance about whether this was a whole life case or not. A whole life order means that the defendant will never be released. We needed to make sure that we could prove that she would never have got into his vehicle voluntarily and must have been tricked into getting into the vehicle. That is a situation that had never arisen before. Police officers had murdered, but they had never done so whilst acting as a police officer. And that is what made this case stand out as a potential case for a whole life order. It was incredibly tense in the court. It was the first time the defendant had appeared in person, not via video link. It just feels really raw and emotional to have everyone there, particularly when Sarah's parents and sister went on the stand. Jeremy Everard looked at Wayne Cousins and said, please, Mr Cousins, look at me. There was a minuscule shift and then straight back down again. So he didn't even have the ability to do that. So this is the photograph that was contained within one of the 
victim personal statements, uh, which was produced by the family and which had never been seen in the press before. But the family wanted to use a photograph to show and reflect their own private view of Sarah. She was my precious little girl, our youngest child. The feeling of loss is so great, it is visceral. And with the sorrow comes waves of panic at not being able to see her again. I can never talk to her, never hold her again, and never more be part of her life. I think of Sarah all the time, but the mornings and evenings are particularly painful. In the morning, I wake up to the awful reality that Sarah is gone. In the evenings, at the time she was abducted, I let out a silent scream. Don't get in the car, Sarah. Don't believe him. Run. The judge told Wayne Cousins that he would never leave prison. He said Cousins had irretrievably damaged the lives of Sarah Everard's family and friends. To hear him sentenced to a whole life order made me realize that there was nothing else in our investigation that we could have done for Sarah's family. Lord Justice Fulford told Wayne Cousins, you have eroded the confidence the public is entitled to have in its police forces you have considerably added to the insecurity felt by people, perhaps particularly women. A day since Sarah Everard's killer was sentenced to life behind bars, and today the Met Police issued guidance for anyone feeling unsafe with a lone officer. Anyone who feels in danger after being approached by an officer in plain clothes to flag down a bus or shout to a passerby. They should ask to speak to the control room on the police radio, and if still concerned, just run. Women, first of all, just need to be streetwise about when they can be arrested and when they can't be arrested. It's really important, I think, that we challenge ourselves not to, to, to allow the actions of one a bad apple, one individual, to, to tarnish uh, our police force, which, uh, you know, by and large, has got very high uh, standards and works very hard to keep us all safe. The suggestion that Cousins was an individual on some sort of frolic of his own was unacceptable. Police perpetrated abuse, violence, domestic abuse, sexual assault, rape is not new because solicitors like me have been acting for women in this sort of claim for years. In fact, one of my clients came forward about another Met officer the day after Wayne Cousins was sentenced. She came forward after hearing the victim impact statement by Sarah's mother. PC David Carrick, a 46-year-old serving police officer with the Metropolitan Police, was arrested after he was accused of raping a woman last year. I think that it was when she was saying about Wayne Cousins, the abuse of power, that he used, her words just echoed. I just knew that I had to report him. Now, the Crown Prosecution Service has authorised police to charge a Metropolitan Police officer who's already accused of rape with further sexual offences. There was quite a lot of publicity because he was in the same unit as Wayne Cousins, and that meant that other victims were galvanised and realised that they would be listened to. He pleaded guilty to 85 offences, including dozens of rapes against 12 victims. The country's biggest police force, the Metropolitan Police, in which he served, missed many opportunities to stop him. In the same month that Wayne Cousins admitted his crimes against Sarah Everard, the Met's top brass were insisting to the public that they were driving predators out of the force and doing everything that they could to find rogue officers. They knew that at the same time, a woman came forward to report rape against David Carrick. 
but crucially, he was not suspended. There were women virtually every week coming forward to complain about abuse of power by Metropolitan Police officers, and the floodgates really opened. A former Metropolitan Police counter-terrorism detective has been jailed for three years for secretly filming models during fake photo shoots. Two Metropolitan Police officers have pleaded guilty to taking and sharing photographs of the bodies of two sisters, Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman, who were found stabbed to death in a park in London. Racist, sexist and homophobic text messages sent by officers in Charing Cross, including one male officer telling a female colleague I would happily rape you. Breaking and developing news, Sky News understands that Dame Cressida Dick, the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, is to leave her job. He has left me no choice but to step aside. I say this with deep sadness and regret. A serving Metropolitan Police officer and his former colleague have been found guilty of sharing grossly offensive, misogynistic and racist messages in a WhatsApp group with Wayne Cousins. Sarah Everard's murderer was on a WhatsApp group with other serving police officers sharing racist and misogynistic messages. If people are allowed to trade in these obscene messages and they're not held to account and nobody stops them and nobody reports them and that continues, I think it can give them a sense of power and a sense of impunity. It creates a culture of unacceptable behaviour and you're really potentially allowing a monster to thrive. How many are there that you know are going through the justice system? Most weeks there's two or three officers going to court for um, criminal cases. Um, which tends to be a, a mix of sort of dishonesty, violence and sort of violence against women and girls type mm. offences, domestic abuse, sexual offences, etc. We're looking at trust in the police. That is following the review by Baroness Casey into a toxic culture at the Metropolitan Police. The report says a boys' club culture is rife within the force. This report is frightening, a force that is broken, failing. I think what most troubles me now, I've had the chance to sort of think, is how we can possibly win back trust from the public. And I begin to wonder then how endemic it is. I still think back to the early days of the investigation. A few days after Sarah's body had been recovered, I was made aware of a different officer who had been put on scene guard and had been reported by a colleague for sharing a horrific meme. We knew it was going to be published in the weekend newspapers and I didn't want Sarah's family to find out about it, so I went to tell them, which I remember specifically because it was Mother's Day, and I just thought, could there be a worse day? But they've already had the most horrific news they can ever have, so this is just another insult, really, to the memory of their daughter. The Met is haunted by the rape and murder of Sarah Everard, but abuse in the ranks is something all forces are having to come to terms with. 
A former Greater Manchester police officer who groomed cadets on a scheme run by the force has been jailed for five years. A South Wales police officer who blackmailed and threatened underage girls to send him explicit photos of themselves on Snapchat has been jailed for life. Shannon Mulhall told us how PC Simon Miller escorted her to a women's refuge in Grimsby and then slept with her. Today, he was jailed for two years and four months, with Humberside Police calling his actions utterly reprehensible. It's not very often that a case comes along that starts a national conversation, but it is much bigger than just what we see in the police. It's what we see right across society, how issues of violence against women and girls are taken more generally, and we see it seeping through to people's everyday behaviour. I don't think that the incidences of violence against women and girls is reducing or decreasing in any way. In fact, it would appear to me that it's getting worse. Can you leave me alone? Can you leave me, excuse me? Can you help me, please? Can you leave me the fuck alone? Go away, what is wrong with you? Violence against women and girls is a men's issue. Men need to speak up. Men need to stand with women and not against them. Listen up. Men, it's time to do better. That includes you, that includes your dad, that includes me, that includes all men. Sarah could have been any girl, could have been my girlfriend, but it'll never be me. It'll never be me. It never could have been me. That's what women feel in their bones right now. The mayor called those scenes completely unacceptable. The Home Secretary described them as upsetting. When you saw those pictures, did you agree? Did you think it was unacceptable, the way in which your officers acted? I wouldn't have wanted to see a vigil in memory of Sarah end with those scenes. There have been calls from all quarters, uh, many quarters, for you to resign. Are you considering your position? No, I'm not. After Cousins was charged with the kidnap and the murder, that's when a huge amount of work begins for my team to build a case. It's really important that we investigate all lines of inquiry. In addition to this, I still didn't have the answers for Sarah's family of what had actually happened in those crucial hours before her death. We really focused on trying to piece together what had happened to Sarah. We discovered how he told his wife that he was working overtime on that night when actually he, he was due to be on his day off and that he'd marked it on their family calendar, clearly indicating that he was planning to do something and he didn't want to be found out about it. Hello. On that night, He'd hired his car. We know he drove up all the way to London. Sarah went to her friend's house for dinner. 
stopping on the way at Sainsbury's to buy a bottle of wine. They had dinner together, and then she left to walk home. We know he then was driving back along Poinders Road when he came across Sarah by chance. We were looking at every vehicle which had passed Sarah, and we spoke to a really significant witness. She'd seen a woman being handcuffed by an undercover officer, and she hadn't thought much of it other than to remark to her partner who was in the car that she didn't think women got handcuffed very often. Now, what she didn't realize was, of course, that she was witnessing Sarah and what had happened to her. And without that statement, we may have never known how he actually got her into that car. And we think we may be able to make out the fact that he used his warrant card, that it was likely he arrested her for something such as a breach of COVID. We know from Sarah and her friends and family that she is the sort of person who would have been compliant with his authority. He drove down to Dover where he'd parked his own car. It struck me that it's an incredibly long journey and how she must have felt in that car. But it's something that, you know, we can't get away from and can't really ever stop thinking about. He moved Sarah from the hire car into his own car. People have asked how he moved her from one car to the other, and we'll never know. However, in my experience, women who are in such horrifically frightening situations are often just compliant because they want to, want to get out of the situation alive. We were then able to trace his car driving to a very rural area just north of Dover, which is where I believe he raped and murdered her. We recovered a phone call he made to the vet whilst we believe he was stood burning Sarah's body. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if I could book my um, dog in for the, uh, for the vet so I can have a discussion about her uh, issues, please. It's Cousins, C-O-U-Z-E-N-S. The fact that he was able to do things that were so horrific and things that were so mundane and normal at the same time is one of those things that's really chilling. I am Treasury Counsel, which means that I prosecute at the Old Bailey the most serious criminal cases that are conducted and prosecuted in this country. I first met the Everard family in this very room, in fact. It was immediately clear to me what uh, awful trauma they had been put through, but at the same time how focused and resolute they were in terms of seeing that justice was done. The focus of the case then became on presenting the true horror of what he'd done to the full extent. Wayne Cousins, a firearms officer with the Metropolitan Police, has pleaded guilty to the murder of Sarah Everard in March. 
The Metropolitan Police Commissioner looked shaken. In court, she'd sat just feet from the Everard family. He did enter guilty pleas at a relatively early stage. That was obviously an immense relief for the family. All of us in the Met are sickened, angered, and devastated by this man's crimes. There was a sense within the police leadership that they were so disgusted and aghast at what someone within their own ranks had done, and that it was such an aberration that they were reeling from this and they were victims themselves. And everyone in policing feels betrayed. And that it wasn't a massive problem, that there was just a small number of bad officers. The Metropolitan Police have faced many difficult times and much criticism, but this must be their darkest day, their own officer pleading guilty to murder. And how did he become an officer when he'd faced exposure allegations in 2015? In Dover, two years before he joined the Metropolitan Police, cousins were suspected of indecent exposure. No action was taken. In 2015, Kent Police received a report of a man driving around naked from the waist down. Now, the eyewitness gave an accurate description of his vehicle. There is an image of Wayne Cousins in that vehicle because he was captured on AMPR cameras, and the eyewitness also gave an accurate description of the vehicle registration so it could be linked to Wayne Cousins. He was a police officer at the time, but he was never interviewed and the case received no further action. Had it been investigated, had he been properly identified, potentially he would have lost his job. He would not have had his warrant card. He would not have been able to trick Sarah Everard into that car. Sentencing hearing has begun for the former Metropolitan Police Officer Wayne Cousins. The judge made it clear that he wanted assistance about whether this was a whole life case or not. A whole life order means that the defendant will never be released. We needed to make sure that we could prove that she would never have got into his vehicle voluntarily and must have been tricked into getting into the vehicle. That is a situation that had never arisen before. Police officers had murdered, but they had never done so whilst acting as a police officer. And that is what made this case stand out as a potential case for a whole life order. It was incredibly tense in the court. It was the first time the defendant had appeared in person, not via video link. It just feels really raw and emotional to have everyone there, particularly when Sarah's parents and sister went on the stand. Jeremy Everard looked at Wayne Cousins and said, please, Mr Cousins, look at me. There was a minuscule shift and then straight back down again. So he didn't even have the ability to do that. So this is the photograph that was contained within one of the victim personal statements, uh, which was produced by the family and which had never been seen in the press before. But the family wanted to use a photograph to show and reflect their own private view of Sarah. She was my precious little girl, our youngest child. The feeling of loss is so great, it is visceral. And with the sorrow comes waves of panic at not being able to see her again. I can never talk to her, never hold her again, and never more be part of her life. I think of Sarah all the time, but the mornings and evenings are particularly painful. 
In the morning, I wake up to the awful reality that Sarah is gone. In the evenings, at the time she was abducted, I let out a silent scream. Don't get in the car, Sarah. Don't believe him. Run. The judge told Wayne Cousins that he would never leave prison. He said Cousins had irretrievably damaged the lives of Sarah Everard's family and friends. To hear him sentenced to a whole life order made me realize that there was nothing else in our investigation that we could have done for Sarah's family. Lord Justice Fulford told Wayne Cousins, you have eroded the confidence the public is entitled to have in its police forces. You have considerably added to the insecurity felt by people, perhaps particularly women. A day since Sarah Everard's killer was sentenced to life behind bars. And today, the Met Police issued guidance for anyone feeling unsafe with a lone officer. Anyone who feels in danger after being approached by an officer in plain clothes to flag down a bus or shout to a passerby. They should ask to speak to the control room on the police radio, and if still concerned, just run. Women, first of all, just need to be streetwise about when they can be arrested and when they can't be arrested. It's really important, I think, that we challenge ourselves not to, to, to allow the actions of one a bad apple, one individual, to, to tarnish uh, our police force, which, uh, you know, by and large, has got very high uh, standards and works very hard to keep us all safe. The suggestion that Cousins was an individual on some sort of frolic of his own was unacceptable. Police perpetrated abuse, violence, domestic abuse, sexual assault, rape is not new because solicitors like me have been acting for women in this sort of claim for years. In fact, one of my clients came forward about another Met officer the day after Wayne Cousins was sentenced. She came forward after hearing the victim impact statement by Sarah's mother. PC David Carrick, a 46-year-old serving police officer with the Metropolitan Police, was arrested after he was accused of raping a woman last year. I think that it was when she was saying about Wayne Cousins, the abuse of power, that he used, her words just echoed. I just knew that I had to report him. Now, the Crown Prosecution Service has authorised police to charge a Metropolitan Police officer who's already accused of rape with further sexual offences. There was quite a lot of publicity because he was in the same unit as Wayne Cousins, and that meant that other victims were galvanised and realised that they would be listened to. He pleaded guilty to 85 offences, including dozens of rapes against 12 victims. The country's biggest police force, the Metropolitan Police, in which he served, missed many opportunities to stop him. In the same month that Wayne Cousins admitted his crimes against Sarah Everard, the Met's top brass were insisting to the public that they were driving predators out of the force and doing everything that they could to find rogue officers. They knew that at the same time, a woman came forward to report rape against David Carrick. But crucially, he was not suspended. There were women virtually every week coming forward to complain about abuse of power by Metropolitan Police officers, and the floodgates really opened. 
A former Metropolitan Police counter-terrorism detective has been jailed for three years for secretly filming models during fake photo shoots. Two Metropolitan Police officers have pleaded guilty to taking and sharing photographs of the bodies of two sisters, Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman, who were found stabbed to death in a park in London. Racist, sexist and homophobic text messages sent by officers in Charing Cross, including one male officer telling a female colleague, I would happily rape you. Breaking and developing news, Sky News understands that Dame Cressida Dick, the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, is to leave her job. He has left me no choice but to step aside. I say this with deep sadness and regret. A serving Metropolitan Police officer and his former colleague have been found guilty of sharing grossly offensive, misogynistic and racist messages in a WhatsApp group with Wayne Cousins. Sarah Everard's murderer was on a WhatsApp group with other serving police officers sharing racist and misogynistic messages. If people are allowed to trade in these obscene messages and they're not held to account and nobody stops them and nobody reports them and that continues, I think it can give them a sense of power and a sense of impunity. It creates a culture of unacceptable behaviour and you're really potentially allowing a monster to thrive. How many are there that you know are going through the justice system? Most weeks there's two or three officers going to court for um, criminal cases. Um, which tends to be a, a mix of sort of dishonesty, violence and sort of violence against women and girls type mm -hmm. offences, domestic abuse, sexual offences, etc. We're looking at trust in the police. That is following the review by Baroness Casey into a toxic culture at the Metropolitan Police. The report says a boys' club culture is rife within the force. This report is frightening. A force that is broken, failing. I think what most troubles me now, I've had the chance to sort of think, is how we can possibly win back trust from the public. And I begin to wonder then how endemic it is. I still think back to the early days of the investigation. A few days after Sarah's body had been recovered, I was made aware of a different officer who had been put on scene guard and had been reported by a colleague for sharing a horrific meme. We knew it was going to be published in the weekend newspapers and I didn't want Sarah's family to find out about it, so I went to tell them, which I remember specifically because it was Mother's Day, and I just thought, could there be a worse day? But they've already had the most horrific news they can ever have, so this is just another insult, really, to the memory of their daughter. The Met is haunted by the rape and murder of Sarah Everard, but abuse in the ranks is something all forces are having to come to terms with. A former Greater Manchester police officer who groomed cadets on a scheme run by the force has been jailed for five years. A South Wales police officer who blackmailed and threatened underage girls to send him explicit photos of themselves on Snapchat has been jailed for life. Shannon Mulhall told us how PC Simon Miller escorted her to a woman's refuge in Grimsby and then slept with her. Today, he was jailed for two years and four months with Humberside police calling his actions utterly reprehensible. 
It's not very often that a case comes along that starts a national conversation, but it is much bigger than just what we see in the police. It's what we see right across society, how issues of violence against women and girls are taken more generally, and we see it seeping through to people's everyday behaviour. I don't think that the incidences of violence against women and girls is reducing or decreasing in any way. In fact, it would appear to me that it's getting worse. Can you leave me alone? Can you leave me, excuse me? Can you help me please? Can you leave me the fuck alone? Go away, what is wrong with you? Violence against women and girls is a men's issue. Men need to speak up. Men need to stand with women and not against them. Listen up, men, it's time to do better. That includes you, that includes your dad, that includes me, that includes all men. Sarah could have been any girl, could have been my girlfriend, but it'll never be me. It'll never be me. It never could have been me. That's what women feel in their bones right now.